Okay. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, and also thank you for inviting me into this lovely symposium into uh, Norway. So, um, Zed, I'm going to talk to you about social cybersecurity, try to give you an understanding of what we see this field is encompassing, and then give you some results and work that we've done in this area with my, with my group. And uh, we believe in this area so much that we actually started a new center at Carnegie Mellon called IDEAS, which stands for Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity. And if you get any email inviting you to a conference there, that's what it's from, okay? So um, without further ado, uh, when we look at disinformation, a lot of people have said that disinformation is, you know, it's all due to social media, it's all brand new, it's taking over the world, it's horrible, etc. And the point I want to begin with is what we're seeing today online with things like disinformation is they're not new phenomena. But what's different is the fact that they are going global, they're extremely rapid, and they're very, very cheap to, to create. So for example, Ramsey's the second when he puts up these, these uh, bass reliefs showing you know, his uh, you know, success over the Hittite people, which is arguably a defeat, it depends who you talk to. Okay, it took a lot of people effort to kind of carve that system. Today, our conspiracy theories go more like, Bill Gates is a smart guy, he, so he invents the SARS-CoV virus, knowing that it would cause the world to go on lockdown. If the world goes on lockdown, they'll have to go cashless, but that's okay because he also invests in all these RFID, all these you know, 5G towers, which can control RFID chips, because he's also, being a smart guy, not only invented the virus, invented the vaccine, and when you get the vaccine, you're going to get this chip embedded in your body, which is going to allow Bill Gates' of the world to control you through these 5G towers. Now, this is a much, 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 much more elaborate theory, right? He didn't just say, hey, I won. You know, it goes through this, all this stuff. Right? And of course, there's grains of truth in it, but it took way less money to do that. It took way fewer people, and it spread way further throughout the world than, uh, to the, than the, you know, Ramsey's story. Now, what we've learned, because of all the work that's been done in social cybersecurity, is that in fact, things like disinformation, you know, if you had asked me five years ago, what do we know, it would have been about this much. Now what do we know, it's like volumes, it can fill this room. And part of what we've learned is that everything you're seeing online explodes whenever something happens in the real world, okay? They talked about glacier floods the other day. You have a glacier flood? The, the talk about it online is going to explode. If you hear a tsunami's coming, the talk is going to explode. You know, Trump gets arrested, the, the um, talk explodes. And with the vaccine, every time something happened, the talk exploded. Not just in one country, but everywhere. And moreover, the kind of disinformation you got and what was said changed as the kinds of events that were going on changed. So, you know, it starts with things about the who was patient zero and how did it start. It moves to government responses. You know, it goes to the reopen campaigns in America was a big issue and much bigger than in some other countries. It goes to other kind of protests, goes to the vaccines. And so everything you're seeing online has this intimate and, and really tight connection with what's going on in the physical world. And so when you're studying these two things, you kind of want to study them simultaneously, which presents interesting problems for artificial intelligence, because now you have multiple data streams that don't line up. They don't line up physically, they don't line up geographically, they don't line up temporally, and that creates huge problems for how we have to study them. So the area of social cybersecurity, uh, which has been now recognized by the National Academies of Sciences in the United States as an emerging area of science, uh, is actually this kind of transdisciplinary, at least multidisciplinary, but definitely transdisciplinary area of science that brings together, you know, the computational sciences, the social sciences, the data sciences, the policy sciences, to address how can we keep the internet, you know, available, and for people to engage in it, work in it, play in it, without being subject to undue influence. But it's also a very applied discipline because a lot of the work that's done there is developing new infrastructure tools, 
hate speech detectors, okay, bot detectors, cyborg detectors, and so on. And so where we talk about cybersecurity is hacking machines and data, social cybersecurity is about hacking people, their minds and hearts. The difference being that if I'm going to help my company out by putting in place a cyber team who will be work with the IT people and make sure that the computers are staying free from malware attacks, they do not have the right skills, they do not have the right training, they do not have the right AI tools to do social cybersecurity. It's a totally different set of technologies, tools, and ways of training. And so that's why this whole area was kind of invented. Now, when we think about social cybersecurity in general, there's a series of guiding principles that kind of drive the way we think about the field, right? And one of those is that many of the events are created by people, okay? And that all the work in this area needs to be highly socially relevant. So everybody who kind of works in this area, you know, kind of has one foot in, you know, either the policy sphere or actually, you know, working in companies or whatever. Another key feature of it is that, of course, you've got, a, you do what's called multi-level analysis. So you're working at models at the individual level and the organizational level. You're working at models that involve who is talking to who and what are they talking about at the same time. So if we think about it from um, an AI perspective, you're always combining machine learning and language technology. If you think about it from a you know, policy perspective, you know, you're, you've got lawyers on your team, okay? Um, and th because these are human-caused disasters, they're often, they're only kind of semi-predictable. The same disaster may never occur twice, okay? And so they're, in that sense, difficult to plan for. And if you develop training sets to understand one part of it, you're, as the military would say, you're fighting the last war. You're not, you're never kind of catch up with where you're currently at. So that's kind of one of the, some of the issues and things that kind of guide the way we think about the new kind of science we need in this area. Now, when we talk about this particular area, there's a variety of different kinds of questions that we ask. And there's, these are the kind of six areas of kind of like sub-disciplines within so social cybersecurity that have been recognized and people are working in. The first is social cyber forensics, which brings together the idea of how do we do forensics type analysis, put together the dots, uh, not just digitally, but bringing to bear the things we know about human social behavior, human cognitive behavior, and so on. The second one area is information threats and challenges. That is understanding that you're being attacked or influenced, how you're being attacked or influenced, and who, you know, basically who is doing it. Then there's intent identification, trying to understand why, in fact, a group is trying to attack, affect, impact you. So like we have these sites in the United States called pink slime sites, which are literally, that's what they're called, you know, for the refuse from making pork. But these are literally um, newspaper sites. Well, they look like they're newspaper sites, but they're not. They're actually owned by various companies, and they're putting out very biased and often disinformation. And these pink slime sites are, the question is, why are they doing this? Well, part of it's to get their point of view across. Okay, then there's indicators and warnings that how can I give you an early detection that your community is undergoing one of these influence campaigns, for example, so that you know early on what's happening. Inoculation, how can you make communities more resilient to these? And this involves things like um, doing critical thinking at scale, changing the way we educate people in the, uh, in the social media environment. And of course, countering, where we actually know the absolute least at the moment. So these are kind of the areas. Um, we did this scientific study looking at who was talking, who was writing in this area and so on, and identified which scientific disciplines they were coming from. What you're seeing here is a network diagram where the nodes, okay, like social science communications, are sized by the number of papers that have been written on social cybersecurity that are, that are, that are from that disciplinary perspective. Okay, and as you can see, there's a lot of different kind of areas with communication, social science, information science being extremely big as part of this. Okay. Political science also is right up there. In fact, if you ask political scientists, they'll tell you they're the only ones who write in this area, but they're not, but that's okay. 
but there's a lot, again, a lot of work coming from a lot of disciplines, but you'll also notice that every single one of those dots has aligned to several other ones, meaning that the work is very, very transdisciplinary. Uh, this is just, I kind of gave up in 2017 collecting this data, but the number of papers in this area has gone up exponentially. And of course, there was a little bit prior to Facebook and Twitter, but this has really been a social media driven emergence of a new science. One of the thing, now, one of the things people look at this and say is like, of course it's gone up that fast. It's because it's all about privacy. Not a single paper there is about privacy. In fact, we kept all the privacy papers out when we did this analysis to see what it goes. This is all straight, pure social cybersecurity. Okay, from the uh, perspective of what's going on in the area, uh, one of the grounding disciplines in it is network science, okay? Connecting the dots, knowing who is talking to whom, knowing how can you use these graphs to understand the world, okay? Now, just in case you're thinking, now, oh, now I know what social networks are about. That's Facebook. This is not Facebook. This predates Facebook. Okay, you say, oh, I know what that's about. It's graphical models. No, it's not graphical models. This predates graphical models. Uh, so the area of network science actually... Uh, comes from be even long before World War II. It was one of the very first disciplines, it was actually predates the field of computer science, but it's trying to make sense of the world from a holistic or system science perspective, looking at the connections among things and how the connections among them, the structure, dictates and affects behavior, resilience, et cetera. Now, network science has had a long tradition. There's many, many different people who work in this area. There's, you know, international conferences. But what we see is happening now is then what's been happening for at least the last five years is that the area of network science has kind of grown up. It's matured as a, as a field. And nowadays, not only is it like the third arm of data science, it's also the case that network science is often not, never done alone. It's always networks plus. So it's networks plus simulation, or it's networks plus machine learning, or it's networks, you know, plus MRIs. And so it's always combined with something else. Why? Because we've learned that the nodes in those networks, that it matters what they are, and it matters what's flowing through the links in the networks themselves. So this kind of whole process is one of the important things that underlies uh, what's going on in the area of social cybersecurity today. Um, when we look at, sorry, this thing is not going to stand my head. When we look at uh, now, when we look at the area of social cybersecurity, and we look at the research, of course, most of it is on social media. When you look at social media, a lot of people said, "Oh, how do I analyze social media?" Well, they're talking to each other, they're writing, so it must all be about the narrative. It must all be about the words that are being said, and so we want to do a lot of control of those words. Okay, that's one way to approach it. Uh, the other way people said was, oh, it's a social network phenomena. It's who's talking to whom, and it's all about, you know, those patterns of connections. But what we're finding in study after study over, after study for the, in the past, you know, decade is that, in fact, it's not really about either one of those. It's about both of those together, and it's about controlling and influencing people by affecting both what is being said and who is saying it to whom. And the messages you send on social media affect both simultaneously. And that kind of is at the heart and soul of where social cybersecurity is. So when we look at the digital world, uh, if you use any of these kind of tools that are out there for processing or thinking about social media data. Now, many of you can go and you can pull your data in directly through the APIs for things like Twitter and so on, well, I used to get for Twitter, um, for all these different things. But most people don't do it that way. Most people go to tools like Brandwatch or Scrawl or TalkWalker or one of these social listening tools that lets you look at multiple media at the same time and then say, how's my idea go going? How's the, my brand for my company going? You know, are people paying attention to this new ad? Okay, and those kind of tools use a measure called reach. Reach comes from uh, rhetorical theory, and it's the idea that the more I can get stuff into your inboxes, the greater my reach. Just because you have high reach doesn't mean people really read it. It doesn't mean they believe it, but it means they've seen it, okay? And that's the way we typically analyze social media. From the work that's been done in social cybersecurity, we know that's 
woefully insufficient. And you actually have to measure also how much the community is being shaped and how much the narrative is being shaped. And there are three key processes for shaping the narrative. That is emotional messaging, which has huge impact and can actually affect groups more than other kind of messaging. Things that help develop narrative and things that counter it. Similarly, on the network side, there's things that uh, affect the leader of the group, the opinion leader. They can create leaders out of nobodies, okay, or that can make groups or can reduce groups. Okay, to counter this, we came up with what we call the BEND framework. The BEND framework is looking at the world, uh, the online world of communication in terms of who is doing what, to whom, with what impact. In this BEND framework, we actually try to measure things like, is this coming from a bot or a cyborg? Is this coming from a troll or a person, a government actor or a news agency? Because they all have very, very different intents. They all have different profiles in terms of the way they talk and so on. We want to look at, is this affecting individuals or is it affecting communities and groups? Okay, uh, what is the impact? Is it affecting their echo chamberness, their polarization, et cetera? And then what are the information maneuvers you use to do this? And for that end, we've identified 16 maneuvers. Uh, these are the Bs, Es, Ns, and Ds from which the Ben framework gets its name. But these are things like, you know, backing an opinion leader or uh, nuking a group or um, creating excitement or creating dismay. And eight of these have to do with the community and eight of those have to do with the narrative. And these 16 maneuvers all now exist as operational measures. There's actual mathematical formulas behind them. There's a way of collecting data for using language technology to identify the metrics that go into them and then building these. Okay, so these just for your, I just put this slide in here in case I want a copy of it. This is a definition of all 16 maneuvers. I'm definitely not gonna read them to you. But what I wanna point out is that these maneuvers in studies that we've done to test, uh, test we find that they apply to all cultures uh, we've even translated and worked with them in Chinese, and we've done this in Arabic, we've done this in Russian, we've done this in Tag Tagalog from the Philippines. So these work in all languages. The second point I want to point out is that human beings are really, really, really horrid at recognizing which of these maneuvers are being done to them. Most people more or less get excited and dismay, okay? There may be you know, 80 to 90% accurate there. Uh, so you can pretty much tell someone's trying to get you excited or upset. Uh, people are sort of good at, at back and neutralize where they're trying to say, oh, they're trying to support this person or they're trying to counter this person. Sort of good. They sort of miss it about 30% you know, of the time. And the other ones, people are you know, just barely better than chance, okay? So this is one where computers do much better than, than people, but we don't have training sets. So how do we have operational measures? Because we go back to first principles for taking information from psychology, from anthropology, from cognitive science, from sociology, and built the techniques. Are we trying to build training sets for these? Yeah, do we think they're gonna work? Eh, they'll probably be part of ensemble of experts approaches. Okay. Uh, this is going back to disinformation and so on. I just want to bring this back up. One of the things, there's a lot of problems like this in the space of social cybersecurity. We have something like disinformation. Okay, the bend maneuvers are one of the ways in which disinformation is spread to people. But it's, but it's a very complex environment. If it was just inaccurate facts, okay, we could deal with that. that could, that's more, it's hard, but it's more or less doable, okay? But the trouble is, disinformation itself is hard to identify. Okay, you often don't know when you're being faced with disinformation that that's what it is. Why? Because innuendo is often used. Things are taken out of context. Okay, when it's done intentionally, it's disinformation. Otherwise, it's just misinformation. You have conspiracy theories. You have satire and so on. So you think, okay, taken out of context, sometimes it's hard to identify. We're getting better and better at recognizing it. We're getting better at identifying it, but it's still very difficult. And you might say, well, this isn't a problem, but let's think about the Ukrainian war for a second. Russia has a scattershot approach where they send out tons and tons and tons of different kinds of storylines. 
And if you counter, count, call them on it and say, that's not true, they say, can't you guys take a joke? It was just satire. So people are using satire to hide behind when they're actually spreading disinformation. The platforms out there are trying to identify disinformation on itself to take it down. What do they do? They try to build little you know, uh, tools to help them out. Their tools are absolutely terrible. They don't work across culturally or across languages. But one of the things that they're doing is they're hiring people to go in and look at stuff and say, is it disinformation? Same thing that they do with pornography and so on. And those people, it's a horrible job, and they don't have a very long time working those jobs because it's just so mentally draining. Um, so what, how, how can we begin to get around this? Well, one is by not looking at disinformation per se, but instead looking at malign behavior that leads to where disinformation is just one of the things that malign behavior may cause. So social media, regardless of which platform you're on, it doesn't matter if it's Facebook or Mastodon or pick your favorite one. It's organized into these little communities, these topic-oriented communities, where people are more or less talking to each other about more or less the same things. And these, that's just kind of the way life is. They come and go. Sometimes they last for a long time, like plane spotters. Sometimes they're very ephemeral, such as the one that was around the coronation um, of the English king and so on. But they can become pathological. And you can actually make these groups into echo chambers by simply increasing their density in terms of who is talking to whom and increasing their density in terms of what they're talking about. So you can actually collapse these groups in on themselves, okay? And in doing so, like I said, you create these echo chambers. Now, the, how do you do that? Well, there's three things you can exploit. One is you can exploit the algorithms in the technologies themselves, right? Most of the algorithms out there have a, ver have a search algorithm. Most of them have a prioritization algorithm. And you can actually send messages in such a way that makes your message going to be the one that gets selected and your message being the one that gets promoted to others. And that way you can exploit the algorithms to get your, you know, get things to change around. You can also exploit human cognitive biases, things such as confirmation bias, the fact that people, once they sort of think of an idea, they then say, oh yeah, they read it into everything. And you can uh, exploit what's called social cognition or people's social view. That is, uh, and explain social cognition because it's less studied, but it came out of anthropology. Um, have you ever been at a meeting or a group where people, you say, yes, you someone, why, why do you think that? Say, so, well, everybody knows. And you ask, okay, try, next time you're in that situation where someone says, well, everybody knows, ask them who everybody is. They won't be able to tell you because it's a construct our mind does. Our minds have lots of these heuristics we use to make sense of vast quantities of data by putting it into socially identifiable buckets. Okay, stereotyping is one type of process among that. Okay. But all the stuff online, all these influence campaigns, all the Ben maneuvers, can actually exploit the social cognition as well. And by exploiting those two three things, we can make groups pathological and turn them into echo chambers. <clears throat> these are some of the tools that one uses. Uh, there's bots, which are completely automated accounts that just send out messages in automatic fashion. There's cyborgs, which are accounts that are sometimes run by people, sometimes by bots. So they flip back and forth. Uh, there's trolls, which are humans who are actually out there doing things, basically trying to uh, cause destruction, break up groups, cause turmoil, uh, usually operating under a pseudonym and often doing this by uh, using hate speech aimed at particular sub-communities. Uh, there's, of course, deep fakes. There's doctored videos and images. Okay, there's memes, and there's subconscious cues. Subconscious cues are have been known to us for a long time. They're very widely used in marketing. Um, they were actually banned on TV, you know, like in the 50s, I think it was. Uh, and subconscious cues are things that cause your mind to react, respond to something based on kind of subliminal indicators. And one that you're probably all familiar with is, have you ever gotten a message that was written, an email message in all capital, capitals? You probably, when you got that, you probably thought the person who wrote it is mad at you. That's a subconscious cue is the use of capitalization. Uh, 
pictures that had contained pink or soft colors and other subliminal cues. And we, you know, mentally respond to these things. And most of these subconscious cues operate the same way across culture, across age groups, and so on. So those are the things that are kind of widely, widely used. And I wanted to spend a couple more seconds on bots because bots have this kind of, kind of privileged position in this because we've studied them a lot. Uh, bots, everyone thinks, oh, bots are bad. They're terrible. They spread disinformation. Bots are a tool. They're not bad. Okay? If it weren't for bots, people in Indonesia would not be saved from tsunamis a lot of the time because the bots are spreading out information. The tsunami is coming. But bots can take on many, many different forms. And one of those forms is the, uh, is the broker bot, which is kind of trying to build and build bridges between two groups. Another kind of bot that's often seen out there is the amplifier bot, where you have amplifier bots sitting around things like state-sponsored media, certain opinion leaders, and just rebroadcasting their message. These two kinds of bots are very much used in these kind of influence campaigns we see online. There's many other kind of bots as well, like news bots and so on, but these are two that are particularly useful in influence campaigns. I mentioned fake, uh, I mentioned fake uh, uh, deep fakes. Deep fakes at the moment are not yet that really that big of a problem, unless you're a woman and, and uh, particularly a woman actress, because then your head's going to get put into a pornography video. Uh, with a deep fake, but otherwise they're not that big of an issue. This is the two that came out in the Ukraine war initially. Okay, they were trivial, easy to spot. Okay, you could spot them without even technology. Okay, but the, the point is, using this new technology, we know that the one was aimed to dismay the Ukrainians. The other was meant to excite people. Both of them were fake, and so on. Zelensky saying they surrendered. Putin saying, hey, we won. Okay. So what are some other things you can do? Uh, this is an example of a build and a nuke campaign. The build campaign on the left was from the Euromaidan revolution. This, okay, not the current Ukraine the, before that, the old Euro, the Euromaidan. What they had was you had a group of young men, did not know each other, had nothing to do with each other. They had one thing in common though. They each liked to send messages with these kind of light porn images of women. Now they built the Euromaidan bot. The, but this is actually a network of bots that all mentioned each other. Twitter says, oh, you're a group. Cool, I like groups. I'm going to respond to you and promote you. Okay, exploiting their algorithm. That bot then started sending out messages mentioning two or more of these young men. I was like, hey, Joe, hey, Sam, you know, you might like this image. And, so, and you might like each other's images. And think messages like that. And now those young men started following each other and following the bot. And eventually you had this community that was built around sharing light images, these images. At that point, the bot started sending out messages about where to go get guns and where to go engage in the fight um, in, in Crimea. On the right is, a, is uh, the equivalent of a denial of service attack, but carried out in, um, in Twitter, oh, good old days. Okay, what's happening there? is this is uh, 2018, this is right before Triton Juncture, um, the, big NATO, the big NATO experiment, and you get this blackout over Finland. Now, when you collect data from social media, you're usually only getting a sample. So even if you have, you know, and so what you would be getting was mostly whatever the black dots over Finland were. What, what, so what's going on there? What's going on is this Finnish mathematician loves Finnish numbers, adores Finnish numbers. It's crazy about them. So he writes this little algorithm to simply send out a tweet, you know, counting from zero to infinity in Finnish. It goes left to right, up to down, okay, over and over again. And it's so fast, because it's a bot, right, that it, that it basically blankets out everything else. That's all you're seeing is numbers. This is trivial to do, by the way. High school students do it. You know, MIT does it to Harvard over their football field. You know, this is just trivial. This is kind of a... a, a a kind of game kind of thing you can do, but it can cause big problems. Um, this is an example on the left of a bridging campaign and the right neutralization. The bridging campaign is part of the Reopen America uh, campaigns that were done to when people were fed up with being in their homes and they tried to get the things to reopen. What they're actually bridging in that through that image, and um, you would I, you would never know this, okay? Because but you have to know the flags and stuff. But uh, the folks on the left 
are part of uh, the MAGA group in QAnon. The folks on the right were literally people who were just out of work. And what they were doing was they were showing that they were too part of the same group and then recruiting the guys on the right to be part of the QAnon movement. Um, the neutralized one over the over there is uh, where you know you can get the company, the platforms to work with you and actually remove people. Anytime you have any of these things that remove messages, remove people, you're actually doing a neutralization campaign. And here they're getting rid of the virologist who spread the idea that the coronavirus came from um, what the military labs in the U.S. Now, here is another set of bots, but this is also using a. Uh, the one on the right is the bot. The one on the left is a real person. The, the one on the right is engaged in an engage and explain and enhance information campaign. And what, th what this is, is you have this famous um, um, critic of the CCP and China, which is C.T. Lau. There really is such a person, real critic. And that's the guy on the right um, and has been criticizing China forever. Uh, the Chinese set up a new bot outside of outside of uh, Chinese state-sponsored media called CT Lao, also called CT Lao, can't by the handle CT Lao three, and that particular bot not only sat there and amplified news coming out of the the Chinese uh, media, and this was aimed at the West and at the uh, and at Chinese expats, but they also by taking the name CT Lao tried to discredit the real CT Lao. And this was also the bot that was the original spreader of the news that the SARS-CoV virus was invented at Fort Detrick, taken to China uh, by um, our soldiers, and then released from there in the, in the war games. Okay, by the way, the bot doesn't exist on, on, online anymore because there are no bots on Twitter, uh, said Twitter, even before Elon Musk took over, and promptly they took down all the bots we found. Uh, so they are not there anymore. Uh, this is showing you how distant these campaigns work together. On the left is your um, topic-oriented community prior to information campaigns. The red dots are people, uh, the blue dots are the ideas, and people are more or less talking together, as you can see in the upper left. The ideas are more or less connected, as you can see in the bottom left. And then they're kind of all kind of more or less talking to each other about more or less the same things. After an information campaign where they're boosting the group, they're adding more information, et cetera, the people are all talking to each other, as you can see on the upper right. The ideas are much more centrally focused, as you can see on the bottom right, and then the whole thing is on. So they've collapsed it in on itself by increasing density. That's the result of one of these um, influence campaigns. In the Philippines, this kind of approach was used, in fact, we've seen it used, by the way, in every single election that occurred in Europe and in the US uh, since um, 2018. We have seen this kind of behavior being orchestrated and done. You embed bots or trolls on two sides of an issue. Uh, then you uh, add in some shells as well. You boost the groups up, get them talking more to each other. In the Philippines, it was pro and anti duterte groups. Uh, then you'll wait for, or actually will have an excited or dismay campaign on one side, and you have to throw the opposite campaign on the other side. Uh, that makes the groups get happier or angrier, which basically increases their polarization against each other. And at that point, you back the opinion leaders in the relative groups and try to engage people, which actually pushes them that last little way. Why do you care about this? Well, first you build polarized groups. Now you turn them into echo chambers. And that last little push is done in such a way that it can actually cause the online behavior to go to offline. And in fact, that last little push causes protests. So for example, going back to 2018, uh, right before Trident Juncture, you know, not everybody was happy with NATO, okay? And in Germany, sorry to pick on Germany, um, there was actually, this campaign was being orchestrated that actually got people pro and anti-NATO. The NATO people were all thrilled. Oh, look at all this stuff, everybody loving NATO. No, it was all being sent by the Russians. And then there was, the Russians said, Germany can't, pro can't take part in this because they've wasted all their money on NATO and don't have money for the equipment they need. And they put out negative messages. This got everybody so riled up that there was actually a protest as a result of this particular information campaign. Okay, going on, what happens, how do you make this even crazier? You pick not just one polarizing issue, you pick many. So for example, in the US, we had pro and anti face mask, pro and anti vaccine, pro and anti um, reopen. And all of these were combined together. 
the people from the two, two different groups were linked together, or three different groups were linked together, and then they were given a common enemy, which was, sci which was science. Uh, you can go and then see what was done. And here what we're showing you is that by the time these campaigns had kind of hit their stride, um, the, t the two groups, the pro and the anti side, looked totally different. They're looking at different um, references, different news agencies, Breitbart versus NBC. Uh, the, uh, the Let's Reopen group, which is also the uh, anti-vaccine, anti-face uh, anti mask, is a more centralized, very s crystal clear message. You know, it's all talking about MAGA, Trump, QAnon, and so on. It's, you know, kind of, but it has the same, basically, it's very comparable to the pro in terms of the percentage of tweets and tweeters. But on the right, the pro group, more verified actors, more newspapers, and so on. What's going on is you've got a lot of bots. All those big red dots are bots. And you've, they've coalesced, and they've created this echo chamber, in this case in Pennsylvania, around uh, the governor. You've got this echo chamber they form. The bots, they're all focused to make it, make it an echo chamber. But then they start sending out messages like that girl, Sandra Five, who's a bot sent out, which is back, oh, the governor must love us, but you know we're under reopen. This isn't so great. And so they start trying to neutralize the governor uh, by using apparent back things. And then they try to get people excited about the campaigns. They say, look at what our, our friends in Michigan did. Look at our friends in Carolina did. And they got everybody then to come coalesce and come to these actual protests. Uh, these things look I'm, amazingly similar to what was done in, uh, of course, January 6th, and can be thought of as a precursor, a pre, as a kind of a testing the water, shall we speak, testing the social network waters. To do all this stuff, of course, you need lots of technology. This is our pipeline. The thing I want to point out to you is that we involve, is that, you know, you've got stuff written in just straight Python. You've got machine, you've got language technology tools. You've got machine learning tools. You've got network analysis and visualization for the, for the last part. So, you know, we go in and we find our cues. We to run hate speech detectors and bot detectors on it. You know, put it into the, the network analytics and so on. What this does is it gives the human analyst more time to think and reason about it, okay, because you have all this stuff. The great thing is, where do we use language large these large language models? Yes, we use them um, in various parts of this, but one place we use them also is in stance detection, detecting whether groups are pro or anti-face mask or pro or anti-vaccine. Um, this just shows you the network analytic, which is the kind of uh, language technology one is basically both pulling networks out of text as well as pulling out the cues that I mentioned, as well as doing sentiment analysis, which you should not be doing sentiment analysis. Um, this is the network analytic tool and so on. And this is a tool that is able to operate on more nodes than, um, if the only thing that rivals it in size is Palantir, okay, and which is a big, very big expensive system. But you can see you're doing network analysis placed onto maps, link the words to each other, and so on. Okay, now, net social cybersecurity, again, is not just doing about analysis, it also involves education. So the last thing I want to point out here is education. So we're developing the system called Project Omen, which is for a train-as-you-live, train-as-you-fight kind of system, where your people are using, at scale, social media data, uh, to actually learn how they can be influenced in social media, how to recognize influence and how to do it, and using tools for allowing you to do that. Where, so we actually have a scenario generator that generates a new fake scenario. Uh, that then gives out uh, details that tell you how to create the synthetic data. Then we create synthetic social media data at scale. Uh, then that gets checked to make sure it's accurate enough against the scenario and against what real social media data looks like. Once it's okay to use, it goes into the whole analysis system with a NetMapper and Aura system. We have white cells there to assess it and to give out the gameplay, say, ah, oh, here, <coughs> do this, do that, don't do this, and so on during the whole thing. The green dots, why are there green up there? The yellows is all the kind of data that's generated. The green out there are every single one of those things is involving so it's involving a artificial intelligence in some way. Some cases it's you know machine learning tools. Some cases it's large language models and so on. 
like the scenario generator itself, uses lang large language models to generate fake scenarios. Like imagine a World War III uh, China attacks Taiwan scenario. Okay, uh, so what we've talked about here is just simply social cybersecurity is this growing scientific area. Uh, to be successful in it, you have to target both communities and you have to target what they're talking about. And that um, there's a lot of inauthentic actors. We need machine learning to find these. The Venn framework really is very, very helpful to, for doing this. And there's lots of new techniques out there and more being developed daily in this particular space. So there's lots of key areas where advances are needed. I gave you these six areas before and said these are the areas that the National Academy says are important uh, to do it. After five years, um, you know, and I'm not going to blame it all on COVID, but after five years, many advances have been made in these areas, but there's still lots of work that still needs to be done in each one of these. And you can see that these ran the gamut, right? These include, and it involves lots of different computational sciences, lots of different data sciences, social sciences, policy sciences, et cetera. Okay, thank you. <laughs>